Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the podcast, Something You Gotta Read. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, and I'm talking to you from Martin in the state of Tennessee. And today, we're going to be talking to a good friend of mine who shares a few of my passions, among them the music of Elvis Presley, and, uh, you know, uh, British, Irish literature, uh, all sorts of literature in general. Uh, His name is Jeffrey Longacre, Jeff Longacre. Hello, Jeff, how are you? Pretty good. Nice to see you, Anton. Well, I appreciate you uh, giving us a little bit of your time. We know we're all very busy, especially at this moment of the semester. Yeah. Uh, And uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, a figure that may not be extremely well known uh, in the United States, but a poet of uh, great worth that uh, would like to uh, shed a little light on. Uh, He unfortunately passed away just a couple of weeks ago on the 1st of April. Uh, and his name is Yevgeny Yevtushenko. So, uh, Jeff, uh, you've had uh, a relationship, a working relationship with Yevgeny Yevtushenko for a while uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when you That's were in correct. Tulsa. Yeah. Um, how did this um, relationship start? Okay, well, um, I was uh, working on my PhD at the University of Tulsa. I was a graduate student there. And um, one day, the and, and I had uh, I had seen Yevtushenko around campus. I I had heard his name and knew he was there, and was a you know kind of a big figure, a major figure. Uh, but I didn't really know anything about him. I didn't know anything about Russian poetry. I had never heard of him before going to the University of Tulsa, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, and he kind of uh, stayed in his own little world there uh, in Tulsa. And so I never really you know the first few years I was there as a graduate student, I never ran into him. But the chair of the department called me into his office. I think at the beginning of the semester, I was a graduate assistant called me into his office uh, uh, I think it was about August of 2004 and asked if I would be interested in uh, working with Yevtushenko uh, as his uh, as his teaching assistant he, he teaches he taught two classes uh, there at the University of Tulsa all the way up and uh, he was still teaching this semester uh, even though he uh, passed away on April 1st so he was still still teaching his two classes I understand and um, and he called me into his office and asked if I'd be willing to do that. And I, I said, yeah, that sounds like a, a, a great opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly sounds like a good opportunity. And I must uh, say that I myself uh, was among the uh, many who didn't know much about Yevtushenko. I know my father had some of his books translated into Spanish. Oh, really? My, yeah, my, my father has tons of books. I mean, he's, he's, he's this huge book collector in Spain. Yeah. Um, and so he knew of Yevtushenko, and he had some of his books, but I had really uh, never heard his name before, and this is why it it, it has become you know a big interest for me yeah. to 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 talk to you a little bit about him because I went back and I read a little bit of his poetry, and he really is a very interesting uh, figure. But what was he like as 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 a person, as someone to work with? Well, in a word, colorful, and that that uh, go goes right down to the way that he dressed. Um, he would wear these extremely, I mean, they, they, they would stand out here in Martin, Tennessee. They, they stood out in Tulsa, Oklahoma, even though it's a little <laughs> bit bigger city. These very colorful outfits. Um, and if you Google him online and look at any images, um, especially in his later years, you'll see some examples of some of the outfits <laughs> that he wore. <laughs> they were very colorful outfits. And, um, you know, but it was a bit intimidating at first. I mean, the very first time I met him, uh, he, he called me at home, um, and he still spoke, even though he had been working in the United States for years at this point, uh, in a very thick, what he called his uh, Cold War English, you know, Cold War broken English Russian <laughs> accent. Um, and he called me on the phone one evening and, and told me to, you know, to come to his next class. And his classes were always on Mondays. They were back-to-back on Monday afternoons, one-day-a-week classes. Um, he taught one on European literature and one on European film and cinema, and those were the two classes. And um, he told me to come sit in on his classes the next uh, day, the next Monday, which I can't remember what day of the week this was. He called, and I did. Um, and, you know, I was intimidated, as you might be. You know, I'd, I'd learned a little bit about him by this point, and I knew that, you know, I, I didn't know what kind of a person he'd be. I'd heard some stories, actually, from some other graduate students that he could be a pretty, um, you know, stern and, and opinionated person, you know. Uh, and so I didn't really know what to expect. I went and sat through his classes. They were, you know, very interesting. And after the class, uh, he you know, pulled me aside and he said, uh, he said, look, I don't want you to come to these classes and be a traditional graduate assistant. I just, you know, I might need you to take over a class every once in a while. He says, what I want you to do is basically to be on call. And when I need you, I'll call you and you will come over and help me translate my poetry into English. 
And I said, well, I don't know any Russian, <laughs> Zhenya. And he wanted me to call him Zhenya, the short, the familiar version of, Yev of Yevgeny. And uh, I said, I don't know any Russian, Zhenya. And he said, oh, that, that is, and I won't try to do the Russian accent, but you have to imagine, you know, very thick. <laughs> like, like one of those old Cold War movies. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, like something right out of it, you know. And he's like, he's like I don't want you to, uh, um, you know, worry about that. And he said, I'll handle, handle the, the, you know, the, the rough translation. I want you to help uh, sort of massage the poem from a, what he called it, he himself called it his broken Cold War English into a more refined, uh, poetic, you know, lyrical version of English. So I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so more than translating, you were sort of uh, helping him uh, get the right sound and the right feel for the words and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. He, he liked to use the, 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 the metaphor of a midwife. I'll, you'll, you'll be the midwife <laughs> to the English translation of my poem. So. <laughs> and this is around 2004, so uh, right. he was born in uh, 1933, so by that time he was in his uh, early 70s or so. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but but uh, he'd been uh, working in the United States for a while, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the exact year, but uh, it, uh, since the 1990s, he had, was working at uh, the City University of New York in Brooklyn. Maybe he, he might have even been affiliated with a couple of other universities. I can't remember right now, but uh, it was in um, uh, it was sometime in the 1990s, I believe, also that he began his association with the University of Tulsa. Uh, the president of the university there at the time, who wasn't the same one when I was there, was a Russian scholar, I believe, and that's and he had the connection with Yevtushenko and contacted him. And, and brought him into the English department there. And uh, at first, his uh, uh, I think he taught there one semester a year, and then he started alternating uh, between teaching in, in Brooklyn and in Tulsa for a while. And then by the time I was working with him, um, he was, I hesitate to say slowing down. This was still a very vibrant you know, man with, uh, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, he seemed younger than I was, you know, <laughs> uh, this was a guy with a lot of energy, a lot of life in him. And, um, uh, and so, but he was slowing down a little bit. And so he had, he was uh, solely teaching in Tulsa. I think he had just started doing that though, where he wasn't dividing his, his week up between Brooklyn and, uh, and Tulsa anymore. Um, the rest of his family, um, his uh, wife, now widow, Masha, and his uh, two sons with her lived in Tulsa, and she, she was teaching Russian, still does, at a preparatory school named Edison in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so um, he was settling down a little bit more in Tulsa, even though he would still go back to his apartment in uh, Moscow in the summer. And, and he would also uh, fly to New York. And yeah, and yeah, all over the world, too. He was uh, constantly getting recognized. Uh, and you mentioned him not being very well known here in the States. Um, and perhaps the reason that your father knows him and has Spanish translations of his poetry is I think he's more well known in, I mean, definitely Russia, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and he's more well known even in Europe, though, in other, in other countries than he is here in the United States, um, where... Um, poetry, and particularly his style of poetry, which was that distinct style of poetry that came out of the 1960s, not only in the Soviet Union, but the, you know, the, the kind of beat generation of American poetry and a lot of that more free-form confessional poetry that was coming out of that time period, um, where a lot of that poetry is still appreciated. I think he's a little bit more well-known, so, because that's certainly the, the, he's very much a man of that era, the 19, in his poetry of the 1960s and 70s. We're talking about Yevgeny Yevtushenko with uh, Jeff Longacre, uh, here on Something You Gotta Read. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, and uh, when we talk about Yevtushenko, his life seems to have been not very easy, uh, at least while he was living in in the Soviet Union, in, in, in the years of the Soviet Union, that he was living uh, uh, there in the, uh, you know, 40s and 50s and 60s. He, uh, his family had lots of problems with the uh, Stalin regime, for example. Right. Uh, and he himself uh, was at odds with the government, right. uh, Soviet government, during, you know, a lot of, uh, a big part of his life. Was that something that he uh, would talk about at any point? Or? Yeah, yeah. He was, uh, one of the things that was such a, privilege to work with him is, uh, I mean, not only was he this uh, great man, this international figure, uh, but he wasn't shy about talking about it either. You know, some of that I'm sure is ego. You know, he certainly wasn't shy of talking, talking about himself. But yeah, no, he, uh, uh, I mean, I, I wish now that I had written down when they were fresher in my mind a lot of the stories that he had told me because, there, you know, I'm sure there are many that I've forgotten now that I really regret, uh, wish I wouldn't have. But yeah, his early life in particular, he was born in Siberia. Um, and so, uh, you know, his early life, as a lot of the lives of uh, uh, people born in the Soviet Union, 
in Stalin's 1930s, growing up in the 1940s, during World War II, of course, also, um, you know, had its difficulties. And as a matter of fact, not only is he a poet, but he's a filmmaker, uh, or he was a filmmaker. And um, he made two films. Uh, the first film uh, that he directed was called Kindergarten, and it is autobiographical about his growing up in this time period mm -hmm. and, uh, and his experiences during the Second World War. And one, um, one of the things that we would often do when I was working with him at his house is, um, you know, if I was over there at lunchtime or into dinner time, uh, you know, he, would, uh, he had a housekeeper there that would prepare his meals and, and he would feed me. And, you know, he would, uh, a lot of times he would expose me to Russian cuisine, like I had borscht for the first time <laughs> there, had authentic borscht. But one time he, uh, uh, she wasn't there, his housekeeper was gone for some reason, just he and I were in the house. And, um, and so he was, you know, putting together some things in the kitchen for me. And one of the things that he got out, he said, here, taste this. And it was just, you know, this white blob and it was, and it was like lard. And, and, and it turns out that it was, it was lard, it was pure fat and he was eating it. And he said that he cultivated a taste for it during the second world war when that was all, that was all you could get to. You were lucky if you could get something like that to eat. <laughs> and so he still, even as an old man, remembered those kinds of experiences growing up in the 1930s and 1940s. And I don't know if Kindergarten, his film, um, his other film is called Stalin's Funeral. I don't know if, uh, if these are available on, uh, me keep going. I don't know if these are available on, uh, uh, DVD or, or VHS anywhere. He had his own copies of them, and I haven't seen them for sale anywhere. Uh, but if you get a chance to see either of these films, I you know, definitely would recommend both of them. And his second uh, uh, film uh, was actually about uh, the funeral of Stalin. Right, and it's like kindergarten. It's also autobiographical. He drew on his own experiences. Um, and uh, he was um, uh, part of the crowd, you know, out, outside of uh, Red Square, when Stalin's body was lying in state, and waves and waves of people came to see it, and, and, and you know, many people were either crushed to death or injured or almost crushed to death, and he almost was as well. Um, and he actually wrote a poem about his experiences um, going to Stalin's funeral, uh, and like his second film, it's called Stalin's Funeral, so I can read it for you if you like. Is this a poem that you help him <clears throat> translate or adapt? No, no, this was, uh, he, he dated it uh, March 5th, 1953-1987, dash so he must not have finished it until 1987, but that was uh, well over a decade before I worked with him, so no, this is from his collected poems. Uh, so uh, it was translated by Albert Todd into English. Well, here's an example of uh, Yevgeny Yevtushenko's poetry, uh, Stalin's funeral. Jeff? Okay. On that day, that arduous, foaming, terrifying day, when trucks squashed against people, they fought for life in hand-to-hand -hand combat, <clears throat> and old men perished underfoot. Vertebrae were crushed by heels. The pellucid square lay off to our right, and on breath formed into clouds played shadows of March branches. We won't wrong the leader with false accusation, but judgment was passed on the day of the funeral when people came to Stalin over people, for he taught them to walk over people. That's Boris, uh, that's Yevgeny Yevtushenko, Stalin's funeral, and... Um, you know, uh, now that you're reading the poem, I, and you were mentioning that influence of the uh, Beat Generation on, yeah. on the poetry of Yevtushenko and some other uh, Soviet poets of the time, I, I can actually hear that yeah. uh, in, in that uh, poem in particular. And he knew poets like Allen Ginsberg. He would talk about you know meeting with him and having discussions with him, and uh, you know they, they were uh, part of a, of, a, of a whole group of writers that he got to know. In his, he was one of the few Soviet poets that was granted a cultural visa to travel in the West in the 1960s, and so that's when he met a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of these American poets, European poets, and filmmakers as well, as well as other intellectuals. He would tell stories about meeting Pablo Picasso and Federico Fellini and Fidel Castro, you know, so all <laughs> kind, I mean, like, the, 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 the people that he met and rubbed elbows with is, uh, was astonishing. <laughs> There's a world traveler, which uh, is usually not the uh, description that fits yeah. a lot of the uh, uh, Soviet in intellectuals of the time. Yeah. Right? Uh, do you um, have any idea of how he uh, st uh, started coming to the United States? How did he become uh, a professor here at, at, in, in, in America? I, you know, I really don't know much about that uh, when that started. Um, uh, I know that um, uh, the when he uh, started coming into the West in the early 1960s, that... 
um, was the subject of some criticism that he received by some of his uh, contemporary Soviet poets, most, notab most notably Joseph Brodsky, who would win the Nobel Prize for Literature in the 1980s, who uh, strongly criticized uh, Yevtushenko um, as being someone who tended to only criticize the party um, in ways that it would not negatively affect him. So he, he saw him, you know, some of his peers saw him as a critic of the Soviet Union that would, that would only go so far and not really far enough sometimes. Um, I know uh, uh, Zhenya talked about that a couple times too, and I know that, that, that some of that criticism hurt, still hurt him uh, deeply years later. Brodsky, I know, was somebody that he had uh, signed um, uh, petitions to get him out of jail and, uh, you know, when he was under arrest and petitions to let his poetry be published and, you know, you know he, would, he always saw himself as a champion standing up for that freedom of, of letters, freedom of speech, freedom of the arts, those kinds of things. Um, but, uh, you, know, these, you know, this time period during the Cold War was a time of great suspicion and, you know, sometimes, you know, not doing enough could even be seen as a kind of crime, but, you know, but he... He did talk about what you know how he didn't understand that sometimes some of those criticisms and and you know I think that you know I don't I don't know if he had any regrets about it still but I think it still kind of hurt him that some people felt that way about him that that he was just um, sort of uh, exploiting the system for his own advantage in some way and uh, one of the uh, things that he was very vocal about even uh, when he was still living in in the Soviet Union. Uh, was uh, the uh, take of the uh, Soviet government on the uh, Nazi Holocaust and the way that the uh, Soviets dealt with the Jews right. in in um, in the Soviet Union, uh, which actually uh, earned him a lot of uh, enemies and a lot of criticism from the uh, Soviets in turn. Uh, was that something he was still talking about in the 21st century or not so much anymore? Oh, no. No, that was something he still talked about quite a bit. Um, while I was working with him in Tulsa, um, uh, one of the anniversaries, I can't remember which one it was, of uh, his publication of the poem Bobby Yar, which was uh, his most internationally famous poem. That's what sort of catapulted him into being not just a, a, a well-known and great Russian poet, but a, an international figure, um, was uh, uh, one of uh, five or six poems selected by uh, the composer uh, Dmitry Shostakovich for his 13th symphony. And so that, that just added to the notoriety of that poem. And while I was working with him in Tulsa during this time period, the uh, Tulsa symphony uh, put on this entire... Uh, uh, symphony, the third, uh, Shostakovich's Thirteenth Symphony, and Yevtushenko did a did a reading of poetry. Uh, it was a it was a huge um, evening there, and so and and I helped him put together some promotional materials, like a a, a book I have right here that uh, talks about the origins of his poem Bobby Yar, how he became inspired to write it, um, and and how he met Shost or how it. Uh, drew the interest of Shostakovich and how they met and collaborated on this project. And so he was still very much trying to put down his memoirs on these ideas, still talked about these things uh, quite a bit. Yeah, that, and, and the, uh, you know, particularly um, that poem and the notoriety both within the Soviet Union and worldwide that he achieved uh, because of the stance that he took there. When, when still, frankly, in some of these quarters of Europe, um, you know, even though we're, you know, we're after World War II here, we're after the Holocaust, you know, there are still people that, that, that in, in parts of Europe that, uh, you know, wanted to sweep this kind of thing under the rug, didn't want to talk about this kind of thing. So it's, um, you know, it was still a bold move at the time in the early 1960s when he uh, wrote his poem, you know, proclaiming the Russian complicity with this massacre that occurred at this ravine in Bobby Yar. And it's still in many ways uh, something that we're still talking about <laughs> to this day. You yeah. Know, when, when, we, when we talk about the Holocaust, it's still something that creates a uh, controversy, you know, every time that uh, it is brought up for many different reasons. Yeah. But to think that somebody in the 1960s in the Soviet Union was being uh, as vocal as he was, uh, it's 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 pretty impressive, really. I think uh, it has a lot to do with what was known as the Khrushchev thaw. Yeah, uh, right. Right, and he, uh, in in many ways, uh, that um, uh, softening, right, uh, a little bit of the um, of of the censorship at the time. Right, uh, must have been something that uh, kind of allowed him to say several things that he might not have been able to say before. But it still created lots of problems for him. 
uh, where, was that part of the reason why he, he left the, the Soviet Union, you think? Um, well, he never left the Soviet Union. Well, uh, yeah. uh, of course, he, it yeah. was after the Soviet Union had yeah. fallen. But, um, yeah, because actually he was still, um, after the, uh, the fall of communism in the late 80s, the uh, end of uh, Gorbachev's regime and that whole transitionary period, um, he, ser he served, I can't remember what years these were, but he served... Um, at, in the uh, Russian parliament, mm -hmm. uh, I think from the uh, as a representative from the Ukraine, if I remember correctly. That's right. So yeah, so he uh, uh, he was yeah no he would uh, yeah he would uh, you know I have to make sure I correct the record there. He would bristle at the notion that he ever left uh, Russia or the Soviet Union was living in exile. I mean he you know he was living in Tulsa and working there during the academic year, but uh, uh, he uh, he saw himself as Russian, mm -hmm. and you know no matter what was, you know, he would fight against Soviet principles and, and some of those I ideas, but he was Russian through and through, you know, <laughs> and so he, you know, he was going to stay there and fight for those kinds of things. Um, he actually wrote a novel um, about his experiences during the end of that, um, uh, that transition from communism into uh, the, uh, well, whatever Russia became, you know, politically after that point, you know, democratic and then kind of an, an oligarchy under Putin that it is now. Mm -hmm. um, but he, uh, 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 one of his uh, novels that he wrote is called uh, Don't Die Before You Are Dead, and it's about his experiences in that, in that time period as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, not only a poet and a filmmaker, but a novelist, often drawing from his own autobiographical experiences in all of these genres. Mm -hmm. And he was actually uh, a supporter of Gorbachev, as, as, as yes. you said. Yeah. And then afterwards, also of Boris Yeltsin, even though he became very critical of Yeltsin once, Yeltsin sent troops to Chechnya. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, he, he was definitely uh, a, a political person who was critical. Yeah. Uh, actually, and, and it doesn't look like he was the kind of person who would uh, criticize just a certain people because they were not friends of his or anything. He would support people, but he would actually take the support away whenever he thought that something was... Uh, something untoward had been done. Yeah. Um, so I think that's that's an interesting thing about uh, about him. When you said that people were criticizing him for not being critical enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In many ways, he, he he was. Yeah, and I mean that was certainly my impression of him. You know, in the in the the few years that I knew him, uh, Genia struck me. I mean, he certainly had that element that all great artists have of ego. I'm not going to sit here and, and sugarcoat it. You know, he certainly. You know, believed that uh, you know believed in himself, <laughs> and, and 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 that he was uh, that you know that he could achieve greatness. But you know, a lot. But all artists have to have that uh, that drive and that e and that ego to a certain extent. But uh, no, the the Genia that I knew, though uh, the Yevtushenko that I knew, was um, uh, always wanted to stand up for those who didn't have a voice, who uh, were were being oppressed by. Um, uh, any kind of government around the world. And so he always took those occasions to uh, speak up and to write poems and to, and to try to tr try to draw attention to those those uh, events going on and, and give a voice to the to the voiceless there. yeah. We're talking about Yevgeny Yevtushenko with Jeff Longacre here in Martin, Tennessee. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, and this is the podcast Something You Gotta Read. Uh, and, um, you know... Uh, when you met Yevtushenko in the uh, early 2000s, you were talking about 2004, 2005, uh, mm -hmm. in post-9-11 uh, United States of America. Yeah. Um, what was, uh, if any, or if you remember, um, his take on uh, the situation of the United States at the beginning of the 21st century? Was that something that he talked about much, or would, would he just gloss over that and just concentrate on other things? Oh, no, he, you know, he talked about it all right. I'm, I, I don't know if I remember much specifically that, that he's, you know, he was obviously critical. Uh, uh, by that point, uh, the United States was involved in military operations in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, so he was, he was uh, as you might imagine, very critical of those military operations, very critical of the George W. Bush regime. Um, one of, uh, uh, around that time, what, what, during the time I was working with him, about a year into our working relationship was when uh, the fall, when Hurricane Katrina, the fall of 2005, um, and he wrote a poem about that, um, uh, about New Orleans, and New Orleans was one of his favorite cities, and 
and he wanted to write about that catastrophe. And that was one of the poems. I can't remember the title of it off the top of my head right now, but that was one of the poems that I helped him translate. And of course, um, you know, that was a, he saw that as a great travesty and and a, uh, and indicative of of a lot of the problems uh, with our country with our government, the lack of response, and, you know, a lot of stuff that's been documented elsewhere, of course. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he was appalled, just as, as were a lot of people, by those kinds of things uh, at that time period. And, and often, you know, even all the way to the end of his life, um, when, when events like that happened, he felt uh, compelled to express himself in poetry. He was a poet uh, to the very end. Uh, one time around that time period, I did ask him about Vladimir Putin was the president of Russia at the time, and as you know, still is today. Now, um, you know, I didn't know much about Putin at the time, so I just asked him one time casually what he thought about Putin. I think it was when we were having uh, drinks, uh, taking a break. Um, d- during the translation process, he would often offer me, um, you know, some, some uh, wine or, or uh, you know, something like that, you know, while we were taking a break, some snacks. And uh, he pa- I'll, I'll never forget it. He had steely blue eyes, a you know, very intense stare. And anyone that's ever met him uh, would, uh, would would probably remark on that. That was one of the first things, other than his colorful outfit, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, it, I mean, he would stare you right in the eyes with this cold, penetrating uh, uh, stare. He had these icy blue eyes. And I remember he paused for a moment to collect his thoughts, leaned in to me, and the only thing that he said about Putin at the time, that I remember at least, is, once KGB, always KGB. And then he kind of just leaned back as, as if though, as if that pretty much summed up everything he and, and therefore I <laughs> needed to know about Vladimir Putin. And I'll tell you what, you know, this was around 2005 probably when he said this to me. That was one of the most prophetic things that, <laughs> that, he, that he said to me. I think uh, uh, that has proven true time and again <laughs> since then. <laughs> there was no riddle about that. No, it no. It sounded but I, like it, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was before the whole, all of the business with the Crimea and, and everything that, you know, a lot of the things that have come out in the past, you know, five, five to ten years, you know, so this was before that. And now the possible relationship with the United States. Right, uh, yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, now, you've, you've, des- uh, you've described Yevtushenko as both a colorful person, and this uh, anecdote kind of presents him as a fairly intense person as well. Yeah, he could be both, and he could, you know, swing on a dime on you, you know, and a master performer also. I mean, I just read one of his poems a few minutes ago, but um, uh, you can see on YouTube several of his live performances. And really, if you want, if any of you or your listeners are interested in getting to know Yevtushenko's poetry, more so even than reading his poems and books, I would recommend looking at some of these performances on YouTube because he was a consummate performer. Uh, he was brilliant at it. And, you know, that's part of what aligned him, I think, with this 1960s generation, like the Allen Ginsbergs, for instance, from the United States, um, his art was a very performative art, and you mm-hmm. lose some of it when you don't get the performance. And so, for instance, if you want to see uh, how he read Bobby R., I know that you can find several examples of him doing public readings of Bobby R. on YouTube, and you should see the, the way that he read it, the emotion that he brings to the poem, and, uh, and you'll, really, you'll really see what he was capable of as a performer um, you know, in, I mean, it came across live so well, and of course, mm-hmm. you know, that's gone now, but luckily we do have some of those recordings that you can still get a sense of what that was like, the electricity in the room during these live performances. So, so yeah, he was, you know, he could be funny and intense and serious, all, you know, you know, all within the space of a few moments. <laughs> <laughs> but what was it like working with him when you actually had to sit down and, you know, work with him on these poems? Because I suppose with your not knowing Russian, right, yeah. you sort of... Um, I wouldn't say adapting, but definitely, as we said before, finding the right voice, the the, the right words, that you know, to convey what he wanted to say in right. English. Right. Right. Um, what was it like sitting down with with Zhenya, uh, with um, uh, Yevgeny Yevtushenko, and working with him on these poems that are very much a part of who he was? Well, after I got over that initial intimidation, he was actually a very uh, uh, warm, understanding person. And, and one of the things that I think he respected, and one of the reasons I think he and I got off on the right foot from the very beginning, is, you know, he had, you know, I wasn't the first graduate assistant nor the last one that would work with him. And, I, and I'm sure he had had his share in the past that were intimidated by, you know, who he was and his reputation and would, and would tell him what he wanted to hear, I think. I think, you know, from the get-go... Um, I would tell him 
if I didn't like something or I would push back against certain phrasings in his poetry. And I think, I think that is almost immediately what he respected mm-hmm. in, in our relationship. And so I, I found, I mean, you know, I don't ever remember getting, you know, getting in any fights with him or him being, mm-hmm. in, you know, intimidating with me again. He became almost like a, uh, uh, you know, like a, 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 an uncle that you want to hang out with all the time kind of, <laughs> kind of relationship. And so he would, um, I mean, one thing that would be frustrating sometimes is he did expect you, you know, that I would go weeks without hearing from him, you know, as a graduate assistant, so I'd be doing my own thing. Um, and then, but then when he had a poem that he wanted to work on, it was almost as though it were in a, it was an emergency. Um, and, <laughs> and, th- and I was, uh, I had a, uh, uh, as my oldest daughter, Blake was about four or five at the time I started working with him. And my youngest daughter was born, um, the second or third year I was working with him. And so I, you know, I had quite a bit of uh, responsibilities at home, but sometimes he would call 11, 1130 at night, midnight, you know, and I would pick up the phone and, and it would always be an emergency, you know, Jeffrey, I need you to come over and, and uh, it's, it's extremely urgent. You come over in the morning. So I would have to, you know, it'd be a, Saturday would be the next day or something. I'd have to show up at eight. And so some, you know, again, I wouldn't work with him for weeks, but then is what that is what the, the trade off would be is I might have to spend 10 hours straight working with him on a Saturday because <laughs> once he got motivated to, to finish this, finish a poem, and a lot of times he wanted to do this in a timely way because he was, you know, like the one on Katrina, um, like one that I have mentioned to you before for a Facebook post. I, uh, the first poem I worked with him on was a translation of a poem he wrote called School in Bezlan, which was his immediate response uh, to the tragedy in Bezlan in uh, 2004, I believe it was. So uh, that was that was the very first, you know, my very first experience outside of meeting him and seeing him teach his class that one time. And um, and he and the urgency was the Guardian wanted to publish this poem, and so he wanted you know and you know he wanted to get it done in a very ch- timely way. And so mm-hmm. I had to go spend the the majority of a weekend working with him on translating his poetry. But it's what this would almost always be like is I would show up at his uh, house. He had a beautiful two story home in uh, central Tulsa and um, I would come in and he would you know he would greet me he was always very friendly and very warm his house was filled with original artworks uh, from artists that he knew and met personally that gave them to him as gifts he had a uh, uh, a Robert Rauschenberg that was signed to him over his fireplace in his home uh, you know not a print an original you know he had a <laughs> Max Ernst painting in his dining room not a print again an original from that was given to him by Max Ernst mm-hmm. um, and so I mean it was always it was always a, a treat to go over to his house for one thing um, and but we would almost, usually when I would show up he would greet me very pleasantly ask if I needed anything but then we would go upstairs which is where his home office was and I would sit he, he would you know he would say don't be shy you know come up here and I would sit uh, uh, leg to leg, you know, we would literally be side by side, almost like Siamese twins, you know, <laughs> and he would sit there at his computer and he, and he had his, the poem in Russian and, you know, handwritten in front of him. And he would, he would go line by line and start to try to put together a rough transition. He would tell me what a word meant. He would, you know, point to a word and he would say it in Russian at first. Then he would kind of break it up into English a little bit. And then he would, you know, he would say what a word or a line meant. Then he would say, is that, you know, does that sound good in English? How does that sound? And we would kind of, and we would just go back and forth that way. And it would, sometimes it would go more smoothly than others. When it didn't go more smoothly, that's when it would take a a long time to do even a relatively short poem. Mm -hmm. We might, we might have to work on a couple of lines for an hour or two, you know, just kind of going back and forth and, and trying to hammer out uh, some of the, uh, uh, the idiosyncrasies you know, between the languages there, you know, and again, I don't know the Russian, so, you know, he had to, he had, you know, he would, you know, I really, you know, I relied on him for that, and it was, it was trying to find, though, nuances in English and, mm-hmm. and, and approximations for those nuances, so, I mean, I, I learned a great deal, I mean, even though I didn't know Russian, I learned a great deal about the translation process, about, about translating works from one language to another, but just translation and adaptation in general. Mm-hmm. Concepts that I still use in, in a class, for instance, talking about teaching literature and film, you know, you're not t- talking about translation from different languages, but from one medium to another. And certain certain compromises and concessions have to be made. So I just I learned so much from mm-hmm. from this process and from working with him. But he was a very a, a very warm, uh, free spirited um, a generous man. I loved working with him after I got to know him. After that initial and kind of uh, intimidation and apprehension wore off. I mean, every once in a while, you know, I'd, uh, after a tiring week, I'd get one of those calls at ten at night. And I'm like, oh no! I'm, but um, <laughs> but uh, you know, just because the way that life is, you know, mm-hmm. you get busy. Um, but once I got there, and after we got started working, I ne- you know that would go away, and I would because he would you know we, we would take breaks, and he would tell me these stories. 
um, and 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 he would feed you know he would feed me you know a, a nice Russian meal and uh, give me some <laughs> drinks, open a bottle of wine, these kinds of things. We would often go out and have drinks after translating a poem, or you know he took me and my family out to dinner a couple of times with his family. I mean he was a uh, he was a very generous, uh, uh, passionate man. And translations would become and, easier that way. Yeah, yeah, they would. They would. Yeah, they would certainly become smoother at that point. I don't know if the grammar might have suffered a little bit, but <laughs> but yeah, the, yeah, the, the translations would become easier at that at that point. <laughs> Um, one of my yeah, and if you don't mind, one of my favorite stories that he told me, uh, he knew uh, the filmmaker Federico Fellini, mm-hmm. and uh, and so uh, uh, a story that he loved to tell. I think I heard it more than once, but it was one of my favorites, so I didn't mind. Um, he and I don't know if I'm going to remember all of the details. This is one of the ones I wish I would have written this out, you know, verbatim right after I'd heard it. But um, I know that that he and Fellini had been hanging out there. He was there in Italy on you know on one of his travel visas. This is in the in the early to mid 1960s. Um, and that evening, they uh, he went over to dinner at Fellini's house, and his uh, wife Giulietta Messina, I think was her name, uh, you know, cooked this elaborate you know, three or four course Italian. It's wonderful dinner. He said it was, it was one of the best meals he had. He, I think he spent about five minutes just talking about the dinner, and uh, several bottles of wine were opened and passed around during the meal, as as happens in Italy. Um, and so there, you know, there were there was a lot of uh, carousing and carrying on, and their house. Uh, or at least the house they were at was by the beach, and so after dinner and after and after these drinks, uh, Genia had the idea to to run down to the beach and and go do some night swimming, I guess. And Fellini was trying to warn him against this. He's like, "I don't, Genia, I don't think this is a good idea," you know. And he's like, "You know, uh, being the poet free spirit, I guess he is." He's like, "You know, I, I don't care. I'm going to run out and jump into the surf in the sand, or you know, I don't remember what he said <laughs> now." But um, you know, Fellini followed him in his in his typical Fellini uniform, I believe, like you know, black slacks, a button up white sleeve sh- shirt with a black tie. You know, is following Yevtushenko down onto the beach, and and uh, Genya is, I guess, throwing off his clothes and going out into the surf, and uh, he got a cramp. Uh, from you know not only the drinking but all the food he just eaten he hadn't you know that what your mom always told you you know about don't go swimming too soon after <laughs> you know, I guess that 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 was coming back to haunt him and was getting caught in an undertow and so he you know he was and he's a good Genia uh, was a good swimmer and uh, I remember he would still uh, swim for exercise when I knew him he was still do, you know would go swim laps so he was a strong swimmer and he was getting pulled out to sea he said and and as he was fighting with the the current and with the waves he said he felt he just felt something grab his calf and with you know grip it, you know, like with a death grip and pull him back in. And it was Fellini. He would come out into the surf and grabbed his calf and pulled him in. And his fingers had left uh, fingernail marks in, 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 in red marks in Genia's calf there. And he said, uh, you know, so Fellini had saved his life. And he said he was going to be, he was forever in debt to uh, Fellini for saving his life. And he, and he said that for the next couple of days that Mark was on his calf there and he would show it to people and say, look, that's Federico Fellini's signature. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that was one of my favorite anecdotes that he would tell me because I'm a bit, you know, uh, he knew that I, I loved film a lot. And so he would tell me stories about filmmakers and, and you know, Fellini was one of those that, that he knew. Um, so. So, so in many ways, Fellini was the reason that you actually met Yevtushenko because he saved his life. I, yeah, I guess and so. Then, yeah, he wouldn't have still been alive, perhaps, <laughs> if, at that point. So yeah, uh, I also have Federico Fellini to thank for <laughs> the opportunity to work with Yevtushenko, yeah. <laughs> and are there any other uh, poems by Yevtushenko that you would like to read that, that you have chosen or any, any particular favorites that you have? Uh, the one you read uh, about Stalin's funeral is, is particularly powerful. Yeah. Uh, but if there's any other uh, poem you would like to uh, let our re- uh, listeners know about, uh, uh, that would be uh, that would be I think very interesting. Um, this is uh, uh, a particular favorite of yours. Yeah. The, uh, well, and since we were uh, is what made me think about it, and there are several. I of his that I like and um, uh, but since we were talking about film again um, he wrote a poem called To Charlie Chaplin in 1978 which I've uh, uh, I've come back to and I like quite a bit um, and uh, again this isn't one I worked on him with I can I can share one of those if you'd like for me to but uh, uh, this is one that he wrote earlier uh, than, than our meeting it's tra- it was translated into English by uh, Albert Todd again who's one of his chief uh, translators. I think I think that might be the edit. Yeah, I think that might be who edited this volume of collected poems from 1952 to 1990. I have here. Yeah, edited by Albert C. Todd. Uh, so he was one of his primary translators into English uh, up to this period. Uh, but uh, this is a poem um, about Charlie Chaplin and about I think his love of cinema and what a figure like Chaplin meant to him. Um, 
uh, growing up and uh, and to I think into Europeans and to humans in general, you know, in, the, in this time period. So, um, so yeah, I can read this one if you'd like for me to. Evgeny Yevtushenko in the voice of Jeff Longacre. In parting with Chaplin, there's no parting with Charlie. He freezes, he starves, he's alive, as in the beginning, when in preposterous shoes, shedding their souls, he pounded out against Klondike Frost's a tap dance of mortal sadness, and, too eager, for the ludicrous, for the spicy, boring holes through the screen with its eyes, a world drowning in blood grasped for Chaplin's cane, like a straw. They darned the screens. The generations changed. Why laugh at tormented Charlie? They should have guffawed murderously at Hitler in time, who might never have grown from a clown into a Fuhrer, and laughter at tragedy became unredeemable guilt. So little is funny when the hideous for us is humor. Comic sparks, as though real, flashed in millions of retinas. And the one man not laughing at Charlie was Charlie himself. And Chaplin got an answer from Charlie. Why a never-ending callous laugh pursued the little man? Because he was for all that a man. I froze and hungered. Both tanks and dogs snarled at me. I saw fascism and not the living Christ. But if there had not been the sorrowful little black-haired imp, Charlie, I would not be the same, and the era would not be the same. Parting with Charlie is parting with a whole era, and how good it is that now no one finds this funny. Abandoning the alien movie of lying sounds, he departs for death into a silent film that's his alone. Without Chaplin, people already have started to be a little bored. But Charlie remains, and we will wait a little, until for Chaplin, Charlie clicks glasses with the universe, his empty shoe filled with Klondike rain. Evgeny Yevtushenko on Charlie Chaplin. Uh, beautiful poem, uh, you said from the 1970s. Right? I think 1978, 70s. which I'm not sure, um, I didn't look this up beforehand, so don't quote me on this, but that might be around the time Chaplin died, because like I said, he liked to, mm -hmm. to write poems on significant occasions, so I wouldn't be surprised if that's around the time Chaplin passed away, or in, or in some sense, his reflections on Chaplin and, and the era, uh, not only of filmmaking, but of world history that he mm -hmm. came to represent because of his fame. And it wouldn't be surprising because, you know, Chaplin is a figure that many poets come back to, and in fact, you know, now that I'm doing a little research on the relationship between jazz and Spanish literature of the uh, 20th century, uh, there were quite a few poems written about Charlie Chaplin uh, in Spain in the 1920s, 1930s, and, and later. Uh, but this really reveals uh, Yevtushenko's knowledge about uh, perception of uh, cinema. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know that one of the things that you and I have in common is our love of uh, the cinema, the movies. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and you said that Yevtushenko, you, you've told a story about Yevtushenko uh, that involves uh, Fellini. Mm -hmm. uh, what other kinds of uh, cinema, what other uh, directors did uh, Yevtushenko admire from your um, conversations with him, would you say? Well, not just the conversations, but let me try to think about what, I'm trying to think of the, remember the films that he showed in his uh, European cinema class, because of course that would uh, indicate, you know, those were his favorites. He picked what he wanted to and taught what he wanted to, you know, <laughs> he had earned that right. That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Fellini was uh, definitely one of his top, if not his favorite, one of, and not just for saving his life. He he already he respected uh, his style and form quite a bit already before that. Uh, Fellini, I think, they were kindred spirits in a lot of ways. When I, when I watch some of Fellini's films, I can see a lot of genius spirit in that kind of style, and I think that that was a big influence on his own style and his own films, like Kindergarten and the social criticism. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Realism. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, and the kind of mixture of a kind of you know, what we nowadays call magical realism, but the kind of absurdity or surrealism with realism that you get that Fellini becomes a, a major figure for. Um, he, he particularly liked a Russian film. I'm not going to remember the director's name right now that you've put me on the spot, but um, it's <laughs> called The Cranes Are Flying. Mm -hmm. I believe the Criterion Collection has this okay. on DVD and Blu-ray. I cannot remember the filmmaker's name right now. 
though, but it's called The Cranes Are Flying, mm-hmm. is the name of the, the film during the Soviet era. Um, let's see, let me see if I can remember anybody else that he particularly liked. Um, so would you say that he favored, um, so to speak, uh, social cinema? Uh, maybe because he comes out of that era of the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, I would say social cinema as long as it was poetic or lyrical social cinema. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you, know, I don't, you know, I don't think that he would have... Uh, he would have certainly, because of his background, bristled at propaganda, as you can imagine. You know, <laughs> out, outright propaganda and documentary of that style, probably. Um, uh, you know, I think that's why the, it's the it, it's not just the social commentary of Fellini, but it's the lyricism and and the uh, the poetry of his uh, cinema. I remember him talking a couple of times about the uh, uh, Soviet filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky, mm-hmm. who he liked quite a bit. Um, uh, I, I, he met him, I think, on a couple of occasions, and Tarkovsky came under some. Uh, he he came under some problems with Soviet censorship I, in the nineteen sixties and seventies, um, and and I know Yevtushenko sympathized with him on the on those grounds. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that the the style and the the very deliberate and uh, and slow pacing and kind of serious tone of Tarkovsky might not have been all the way to Yevtushenko's cup of tea, <laughs> like, like again, like Fellini would be the prime example of. Um, I remember him telling me one time that he got a call, or maybe it was a letter from Ingmar Bergman when Kindergarten came out, um, and, and, uh, and I think he appreciated Bergman's cinema as well. But again, I think it was pretty, uh, pretty dour and dark for what Yevtushenko's personality and tastes were like. But he was, uh, uh, but he um, was, uh, very happy that Bergman saw his film Kindergarten when it came out in the mid 1980s, and was very complimentary of Yevtushenko's film, and he and that meant a lot to him. I mean, because he mentioned it to me, you know, to have a filmmaker, uh, uh, you know, he was just he was a primarily a poet who was kind of just making a film, almost I think as he put it, you know, as an as an amateur, you know, <laughs> and to have this recognized master of world cinema, cinema, and Mark Bergman say complimentary things about his film uh, was. Um, you know, he th- that meant a lot to him. So I mean, that was something he mentioned. But mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't think he ever met Ingmar Bergman. I don't remember him telling me that he met him. I think it was a letter or a mm-hmm. call he got from him. Um, I'm, I'm having trouble now remembering though any other filmmakers that we, you know, any other films that we watch that he would teach in the European cinema class. Or I think those were good examples though, yeah. because it gives us an idea of the kind of cinema that he might have been interested interested in, and and maybe some of the reasons why, since yeah. you know you, you you knew him personally, uh, and. And you can tell that maybe certain movies, certain directors, he would appreciate more yeah. or less based on the kind of uh, movies that they made. He liked a lot of the new American cinema of the 1960s, too, that was also influenced by the European New Wave movement. Um, like, you know, the films like Easy Rider. I know he had, he had met and hung out with Jack Nicholson a few times. So, you know, those are some, <laughs> some other stories that he, would t- that he would tell from time to time. Um, but uh, and I can't remember specific films or directors, but I'm sure he liked you know some of the Robert Altman films probably from that time period, mm-hmm. some of that kind. Th- that, that, those are the types of films that, that strike me as his style. Again, very much coming out of that uh, generation. I think he liked uh, uh, you know Truffaut's films, like Jules and Jim, films like that. Yeah, the, the French New Wave mm-hmm. directors. So. Yeah, that makes, makes all the sense, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to an episode of uh, Something You Gotta Read. This is uh, Anton Garcia Fernandez talking to you. And right here in front of me, I have Jeff Longacre, who uh, had a working and a personal relationship in the early 2000s with the uh, great Soviet and Russian, through and through, Russian through and through, <laughs> poet Yevgeny Yevtushenko. Uh, you mentioned also, uh, Jeff, that uh, um, he uh, Yevtushenko had been in touch with uh, important political figures like the Che Guevara, for example, and mm-hmm. um, uh, you, you, you and you mentioned some others before, yeah. uh, like Fidel Castro, for example. Uh, did did he ever tell not necessarily stories, but did he did he talk about them uh, in a casual way, in casual conversation uh, at any point? Uh, did, did did he have any? And anything interesting to say about any of these uh, figures that we read about in books and that we see movies about, but that he actually met in person? Oh yeah, yeah, and he was uh, he was there in Cuba around Castro and his uh, regime shortly after the revolution in the early nineteen sixties. So uh, uh, yeah, no, no specific anecdotes come to mind right now. But yeah, he would talk about Fidel Castro. You know, just uh, you know this, you know, tell stories about him. Like, you know, just a regular guy he's hanging out with, you know. And sometimes he would start telling a story and you wouldn't even realize that, 
that he was talking about a, a name like Castro until like halfway through the story. Then you realize like, oh wait, this just this guy that he's hanging out with is Fidel Castro, you know, <laughs> that, he's, that he's talking about. So um, I think I mentioned to you earlier um, that he had co- he collaborated on the screenplay to a film uh, that was partly Soviet backed called uh, I think it's called Yo Soy Cuba, mm-hmm. um, and uh, uh, and that I, I think that was why he was there in the early '60s was to help work on that film, which was a, a partnership with the uh, Soviet film industry as well. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, he was, you know, he was hanging around Castro and Guevara and a lot of those guys around that time period. Um, he would also tell stories um, about meeting uh, uh, Robert Kennedy, and, the, and he knew the, the Kennedy family well from uh, traveling here in the 1960s. Uh, he never met John Kennedy. I think a lot of his travels were after Kennedy's assassination to the United States, but uh, uh, he did and would like to te- he would often tell a story about when he met uh, Robert Kennedy and uh, Robert Kennedy telling and he asked him according according to Genia, he said he asked Robert Kennedy one time why he wanted to run for president. It seemed like a thankless job. Why would anybody want to do that basically? <laughs> I wonder that sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and he claims, you know, this is again, this is what Genia told me, that Robert Kennedy told him that the reason that he the, the main reason he wanted to run for president is he thought it was the only way that he could find out who killed his brother. So you know I don't, I don't know you know I don't know again you've got to you know you, Genia is the only source to that story for me. <laughs> so it was just him and Robert Kennedy in the room at the time I I suppose. But he, he said that they were uh, they were drinking I think wine or champagne or something out of goblets at the time and he said well uh, let's drink to that then and and he said that they were going to sh- in Russian tradition we have to drink it all down and then shatter the goblets and he said that they they toasted and drank down the champagne and threw their glasses on the carpet only for them to kind of bounce. And he went over and picked it up and they were plastic goblets. He flicked, <laughs> he flicked on the goblet and they were plastic goblets. So they didn't break. And I don't know if that was a, I don't know if that was portentous of anything, but you know, so, so yeah, he would tell, he would tell stories like that about meeting, um, uh, char- you know, I was about to say characters, but these are real, these yeah. are real human <laughs> beings, real historical figures like Fidel Castro, uh, Robert Kennedy. I know he still knew, um, uh, so, and would visit some of the Kennedys uh, up and you know through the time I met him, you know the Kennedy family, um, when he would travel up into the up to the Northeast, um, and uh, 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 there's a, a picture I think I saw it on the printouts that you have here on his Wikipedia page. You can see a picture that he took when he got to meet. President Nixon as well. Matter of fact, it looks uh, reminiscent to the picture of Elvis, yeah, Elvis, of Elvis meeting picture, Nixon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in front of the same. I guess those were the flags that Nixon had all of his photo ops taken in front of. So there's a picture. I think I think that's from the early 1970s, though, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so. you're uh, 19. It says 1972. You're you're revealing here my uh, you know very good sources here that I have Wikipedia yeah. <laughs> uh, that 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 tells you in in, in many ways uh, how little I really knew. About Yevgeny Yevtushenko until yeah. uh, I got a chance to 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 talk to you about him uh, today, and I'm really enjoying the uh, uh, the conversation. You yeah. uh, you've met uh, you work with him, you know, starting in 2004 until more or less when uh, t- until about 2009, 2009, which is when I took the job here in Martin. So about a, a five year period. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and after that five year period, would you stay in touch with him in any way, or or did you not? Not as much as I would have liked to have. As and that is that's certainly my main regret. Now I'm actually going to a conference in Tulsa. It's going to be uh, this uh, October. It's going to be the first time that I've been back to Tulsa actually since I left. Which I can't believe. I didn't mean. I didn't intend to go this long without going back for a visit. But I don't have any family there or any. Or is that the South like Central there. MLA? Conference? It is. It is. As a matter of <laughs> fact. So, so yeah, I had plans to go back this October, and I was very much looking forward to seeing. Jamie and his family again. I was, you know, planning on uh, meeting up with him, maybe going out to dinner, at least for a drink or something, and, and getting to see him again. But uh, sadly, uh, that's obviously not meant to be. Now, um, I did uh, uh, send him a few uh, emails, and uh, you know, send his family some Christmas cards after first moving to Martin. But I did not, uh, you know, as as things tend to happen, you know, uh, way leads on to way, as I think Robert Frost put it, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and we just had kind of lost touch the last the last few years. Uh, but again, I thought, you know, Genia was one of these forces of nature that you just assumed would always be there. You know, <laughs> was, he seemed more myth than man, even when he was alive. You know, and so I just I never even thought about the fact that he might pass away, unfortunately. And and now, uh, yeah, if, you know, uh, unfortunately, a lesson that death often teaches us is take advantage of the present moment and of and and you know if there's any relationships that you've been putting off. Rekindle those now because uh, 
you might not have the opportunity to later because I was yeah I was very much looking forward to seeing him again and and uh, catching up with him. But now that'll have to occur at a later date if it's ever <laughs> going to occur at all. So. And uh, b- besides the 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 kind of work that uh, goes into uh, translating and adapting a poem from one language to another. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you said you learned a lot uh, from your association with Yevtushenko about that. About so many things. Uh, What else did you learn from Yevtushenko, would you say, this this five-year relationship with this great Russian poet? Uh, Well, I mean, you know, I learned a lot of things about Russian culture just from just from being around him and hearing him talk about his upbringing, uh, having his uh, uh, his housekeeper, who was also his mother-in-law, actually, she didn't really speak any English, and so he would have to translate for us. And uh, but she would often prepare us, uh, you know, Russian meals. And I, I went over to a few dinners at his house as well that I was lucky enough to be invited to, you know. And those were always fun occasions. I mean, anything that Genia was presiding over was. Uh, going to be entertaining. I mean, above, you know, beyond, uh, above whatever else, it was going to be uh, entertaining. But I mean, I learned about so many things because he had so many, he had such a rich life. He had so many anecdotes that he could draw from and, and, and pull from, you know, e- even about writing. Um, one of the things I know when he talked about writing his um, uh, first novel, which was a kind of bildungsroman, I believe, I think it's called Wild Berries, I can't remember if that's the exact translation of the title now because I sometimes get it confused with Ingmar Bergman's film Wild yeah. Strawberries. <laughs> Wild Strawberries. Uh, it's called something like that. But um, he told me one time about when he had first published that novel, and I believe that was published in the 1960s and it was translated into English, and he was on friendly terms with John Steinbeck, the American author, which is one of the people that he had met. And one of my favorites, too. Oh, okay, yeah, there you go. Yeah. And, and, and he got a note from Steinbeck, I think, after this novel came out. And I remember he, he never forgot the advice that Steinbeck gave him about his prose and uh, uh, the way that he told the story. He said that, um, I, and again, I don't know, if, I can't remember if this was a letter or if Steinbeck called him on the phone or they met in person and had this conversation. But uh, he told him that, you know, that he, he liked the novel. There were some interesting parts. There was a lot of good elements. Those kinds of, the kind, the kind of politeness that you begin with. But there was a but. He said, but, Genia, you write like you have just one ass cheek on the chair. <laughs> Meaning that there, was an, that there was too much impatience to his prose. And Genia, uh, I, you know, I think he took that as just sort of reaffirmation that he was a poet, not a, not a, not a novelist. He didn't, <laughs> he didn't have the patience to, uh, to, uh, uh, to really develop, develop something story. to the point that you need to. Now, even though he did write a couple of novels, um, I think that that was what Steinbeck's point was. And Genia, <laughs> Genia I don't, I, you know, he he learned from that anecdote, but it must have still kind of stung him a little bit. Too, he, he remembered <laughs> it. He told that story quite often. He would always tell that story to his classes also, I think, to sort of, uh, in a way, you know, that, that was sort of what was great about him, too, is um, he would diffuse situations by, you know, his students, I'm sure, were, because he would teach, these were undergraduate mm-hmm. classes he's teaching, mm-hmm. and I'm sure they were intimidated by him, those that knew who he was, and uh, or had done any looking into it, or had heard anything about it, and, you know, so he would tell anecdotes like that to say, like, look, I, you know, this writing thing is one of the great, you know, people say death is the great equalizer, but so is writing. We all struggle with it. We're, we are, we're all you know, it's frustrating for all of us, and we're bad at parts of it, we're good at other parts of it, and so he would tell anecdotes like that to say, like, I'm not, you know, if I criticize your work or your writing, I'm not above it myself, I receive it also, you know, <laughs> it's no matter how great or, or how mediocre you ever become, whatever level you're at, you know, you're, you're always subject to, to criticism. What, what was he like in the, in the classroom? Oh, he was uh, uh, not unlike what he was like. If you if you go on to YouTube and see one of his poetry readings, he would uh, you know he would talk about uh, the films or the literature, whatever the subject of the class might be. But but he would punctuate these lectures. They would be predominantly lectures because they were very they were usually large classes with you know uh, I can't remember the number of students, but I want you know 50, 60 students somewhere in that number, that, and they would be in kind of a lecture hall, not in a small intimate classroom, and um, and so they were predominantly lecture based, and he would talk about the literature and then punctuate it with a lot of these personal anecdotes, you know, particularly when we're talking about the literature of his own lifetime. Because, I mean, mm-hmm. some of the literature he would teach would be like Pushkin or, um, or Dostoyevsky, you know, r- Russian writers like that that he didn't obviously know personally. But when, when it would get into the eras, the 1950s and 1960s that he was a part of, you know, he would certainly spice these lectures up with the the kinds of personal anecdotes that I'm telling you now. He had firsthand accounts. Yeah, and that I mean, and I mean, what a rare resource to have right there in the classroom. It's like being in a classroom with a living archive. You know, and that's a lot what he was like. Yeah, but I mean, not in a dry or boring way. I mean, it's again that he was the, he was a born performer. 
uh, I mean, he was great at it. And I mean, that's what, you know, regardless of what you think about the merits of his poetry as, as printed or, uh, or, um, or his novels or his films or whatever, if you, if you were fortunate enough to see one of his live performances, that's really where it was at. I mean, he was a, he was a consummate performer, and his, and his lectures were often like that as well. That's, that's what I would say he was like in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's interesting. I've never really had the chance to, to have a class with with somebody like that, yeah, you know, and so, and I wouldn't have either if it wouldn't have been this late in my career. When, <laughs> well, I take, I take that back. I did my, um, uh, I was a theater minor as an undergraduate at uh, Texas State University at the time. It was Southwest Texas State University, and uh, Larry Hovis, who was on Hogan's Heroes, was my acting teacher. <laughs> so I guess Yevtushenko was the second sort of Yevtushenko was more <laughs> more internationally famous probably than Larry Hovis, but it was the second time that I had a famous uh, professor or instructor for a college class. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you were to, um, uh, to to sort of wrap up the uh, conversation in this. Uh, episode of something you got to read uh, if you had to mm, kind of uh, encourage people that have never read the literature or the poetry in particular of Yevtushenko uh, yeah. what would you say to these potential readers of Yevtushenko out there who may not know who he is uh, why should we read the literature of Yevgeny Yevtushenko in your opinion well um, if you want to understand the 20th century and, our, and, and where we are now even today, I think that you have an incomplete picture of a lot of this century if you don't have uh, some knowledge and appreciation of, of uh, Yevtushenko and some of the other Soviet poets of this time period, you know, particularly those, those definitive years from the 1950s you know, up through the 1980s and beyond even. You know, and, um, but, but beyond that, I would say just his passion for life I mean, ultimately, that's what poetry should be about, right? I mean, that's what it should be at the end of the day, is it can have a, it can have a political point, it can, make, it can provide social commentary, but if it's not a celebration of life, of things that make life worth living, then what use is it, I guess, I think? Is, mm -hmm. And I think that's something along those lines is what Jenny would, I think he would agree with that. And, and you find that joy of spirit in Yevtushenko's poetry, it's there. You know that's part of what makes it alive, and he embodied that in his life. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I would say, if you want to get introduced to Zhenya, don't. I would even start with the books. I would go to the find one of the YouTube performances or one of the performances online and see him, see the man himself, mm -hmm. uh, uh, read his own poetry. As far as in summation, I mean, I've thought a lot about this over the past couple of weeks since he's passed away. I mean, how do you sum up? A, a life, a poet like this. I, I really don't know how. I mean, it's, <laughs> uh, uh, he he lived a long life. Um, he was married multiple times. Had five sons. <laughs> uh, uh, met uh, met and got to know so many of the uh, uh, just integral figures of the twentieth century, the late twentieth century. Um, learned from them. They learned from him. You know, had a you know a, a relationship with a lot of these people. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, he, he was a force of nature. He was a great man. And, uh, uh, you know, I, f he was one of those people that I feel like my life is better for having known him. And I'm just, I'm just grateful for the fact that I got to know him not only for a year, but for five years and get, not only got to know him, got to work with, work with got him. To, yeah, I got to have that kind of relationship. I mean, again, I, it was a job at first and I got it as a job, part of a graduate assistantship, but don't ever tell graduate programs this, but in hindsight, I would have done this for free. I mean, it was my <laughs> privilege. It was my privilege. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I got so much more out of it than he got from me or that I gave to the university as part of my assistantship. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, uh, what I got out of it is priceless. You can't, put, you can't put a price on that. So, Well, I totally understand that, Jeff. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, to conclude the, uh, the episode, uh, yeah. of course, you talked about the YouTube videos that everyone out there could just, uh, write his name in. Uh, another way uh, would be to maybe get a copy of his com collected poems from 1952 to 1990 right. uh, that you've read a couple of poems from. Yeah, yeah uh, and he had several volumes that have come out since this time period if you want to see some of the stuff he was working on closer uh, to his uh, recent death, yeah. But uh, to conclude the episode, would you uh, care to read any of the poems that you actually uh, worked with Yevtushenko on? Uh, 
if, if, if you could find one of those. Uh, yeah, actually, I think I have. I, have I, I hope this is the final draft of it. I have a manuscript of one that you can see he, saw, he signed his name here, uh, signed this draft to me and credited me with my translation. He had some ideas from one other person on this one as well. And so this is, so I have the actual, um, this is the actual fair copy that, mm-hmm. we, that we printed up the evening that I helped him finish translating this poem at his house. I don't, I, unfortunately, there's not a date on it, so I do not remember what date uh, that we worked on this poem. But it, but it would be so, somewhere around the mid 2000s. I would say 2005, 2006. Five, mm-hmm. Yeah, somewhere around there. Um, and this poem, and so we'll it will conclude with this if you'd like, is called "In the Country Called Sort of," and he had, he had heard that his his students, his millennial students at this time, using this expression, you know, it's sort of like this or it's sort of like that, and that, that bothered him. There was something about that uh, that American English expression that bothered him, and he wanted to write a poem. And some of the other poems I read were a little bit more. You saw his serious and so in his his uh, political and social side in the Chaplin poem, and of course Stalin's funeral. I think this shows a little bit more of the lighter side, the kind of the gentle satire, and his his uh, uh, interest in playing with language and words and expressions here. So we'll give you like another uh, snapshot. But I did this is one of the poems that I helped him helped in the translation of. I was one of the midwives <laughs> of this poem here. So this is called this is in the country called sort of. A couple of years ago, the Russian colloquial language was contaminated by two very sticky words, sort of. How did this come to be? Why? That's actually an epigraph to the poem. It explains it. I live in the country called sort of, where, very strangely, there isn't any street named after Kafka, where they sort of read Gogol or Dostoevsky, where sometimes even distinguished citizens fall in love, sort of, but sometimes their love is mixed up with arrogance, sort of. Is it true that everybody sort of drinks in your country, sort of? There are some people who don't drink at all, sort of. Hard to believe, sir. Not even a single drop, sort of. What kind of people are these, your beloved Sort of oveners. They are nice, sort of, kinda. Of course, some of them are crooks, kinda, sorta. Are you proud of your grand country, called sort of? Hmm, sort of. Generally, we are friendly enough, sort of. Of course, all of us are for peace, sort of. Of course, we have some petty but unpleasant wars, sort of. Around every corner, in every family kitchen, when wives and husbands are sort of quietly bitching, we have our own sort of private Chechnya, sort of private Iraq, waving any wet dish rag like a national flag, during sometimes hidden, sometimes open scandals, sometimes with flying saucers and sandals, Our mental, sort of, is inside us all, who probably needs head shrinkers. In our courts, we have only sort of judges. In our think tanks, only sort of thinkers. One sort of pretty female sort of in her whispered to me, I've sort of fallen in love when I hear your voice. I am melting, sort of, but not enough. I would like to stand before God as I am, not sort of, not being sort of happy in this sort of life, in this sort of freedom. That's wonderful right there. Uh, and that that's one of the poems you worked on. That's right, I did. I helped him translate Jenny that. With Yevtushenko around 2005, 2006. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things uh, when you when you hear that poem... It's not just the the, the, the the rhythm of it. Right. Um, I can see the, the humor in there, yeah. as, as you were mentioning, but I can see that very, very close under the surface, you can see the social commentary. Yeah, it's always there, there. Yeah. yeah. Like a radio you're listening to in the background, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeff. Jeff Longacre, uh, professor here in Martin, uh, one of my colleagues and good friends. I really appreciate the time that you've uh, given our program and, you know, just uh, 
the time that you've spent here chatting about Yevgeny Yevtushenko, who passed away on April 1st, 2017. He was born in 1933 and was one of the great Soviet and Russian poets who lived in the United States part of his life as well. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Anton. I'm glad I was able to come talk about Genya. And this has been a, a new episode of Something You Gotta Read, uh, the podcast. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, and we talked to Jeff Longacre about Yevgeny Yevtushenko. Uh, Something You Gotta Read will be available on YouTube fairly soon. Thanks again for listening, and we'll be back very soon.